Well, I'm sure you've heard it said, and you might even agree, at least sometimes, uh, that you should always look out for number one. The idea is pretty straightforward. Um, people are not always going to get what they want, and especially people who have competing interests. They want uh, the same thing, but only one person can have it. Um, and the idea behind looking out for number one is, well, you should uh, pursue your interests. Now, where it gets interesting is uh, you pursue your interests at the cost of others. Uh, should you um, always step on somebody on the way to the top? Should you always, uh, you know, look out for yourself even at the cost of others? So, if you're answering yes to these questions, or you know, the, the person who answers yes to these questions is, is some version of an egoist. And we're going to look at two different versions of egoism in this video. We've got um, psychological egoism and we've got uh, ethical egoism. We'll take a look at psychological egoism first. It's important to keep in mind that right off the bat, psychological egoism is not a theory and philosophy. Psychological egoism, well, is a theory <laughs> in psychology. It's the claim that, in fact, people only ever pursue what's in their best interest. People only ever pursue what's in their best interest. And the, the idea is that uh, when you look at what a person does, uh, you can say, well, hey, they believe that's in their best interest. That's the source of the motivation. Now, like I said, psychological egoism is not a theory in philosophy, it's a theory in psychology. And what it's trying to do is trying to provide an explanation for all of behavior. Now, immediately, philosophers, especially ethicists, tend to worry about that, um, about psychological egoism, because if it's true, that means that pretty much all ethical theory goes out the window, right? Uh, because there is a single determining factor for what you do, and that's uh, your best interest. Uh, the question of what you in fact do versus what you should do is the difference in question. The, the question of what you in fact do, that's like psychology. The question of what you do do, or what, sorry, what you should do is ethics. It's, that's philosophy. So, we're, uh, for, you know, Rachel's first looks at an um, argument uh, in favor of psychological egoism. And it's more or less called the, uh, you know, the argument from wanting or the argument from desires. And it starts off with the assertion that uh, you know, people have actions and they base their actions on their desires. So, I desire some exercise, so my, uh, the action I use is, is walking. Now, they add something else onto that and say, like, well, if you have uh, a desire, that desire is always in your best interest. You desire what's in your best interest. So you don't look at, you know, I don't look at, if you can see it, this cedar tree right here, I've got some cedar needles. I don't look at this and say, hey, it's, it's not my best interest to eat cedar, uh, cedar leaf or uh, cedar tree needles, right? So I desire to eat them. No, that, that doesn't really happen, at least not very often. We don't look at things that are, are bad for us and say, hey, I want that. At least, not merely that. You know, there's, there's issues there. <laughs> um, so, you, you get, carrying this further, it's like even if somebody acts on behalf of somebody else's benefit, the psychological egoist says uh, they perceive helping that person out as in their own best interest. So, you know, if you're in uh, a parking lot and you see, uh, I don't know, some, uh, uh, you, you see an, uh, an older customer trying to handle, trying to pull out a, a shopping cart, uh, you would go over there to, to help them and you'll pull out the, park, the shopping cart so they could be on their way. A the psychological ego is to say something along the lines of, what well, you did that uh, because you wanted to get the next cart and they were holding you up. So the idea with, with psychological egoism is like you, you always act on your desires. Your desires are always in your best interest. And even if you're helping somebody else out, 
you, what you really desire is in your best interest. Helping them out helps achieve what you want. And that uh, is the argument from wanting. Now, Rachel's has what he thinks are at least two counterexamples to this claim. Uh, he wants to say that, you know, there's at least two cases in which um, people are not acting out of what they perceive to be their own self-interest. So one case um, is obligation. Right? So sometimes people act out of obligation, even though they really don't want to. Um, you know, you, there's some examples of this I'm sure you, you could be familiar with. So, you know, you're doing what your parents tell you to do, even though you don't really want to do what your parents tell you to do. Right? And you may not even think they'll necessarily get in trouble. It's just, this is what my parents want me to do. I don't want to do it, but they're my parents, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Uh, we can think of the law, right? You don't really want to pay your taxes. <laughs> of course, in that case, you know, you don't pay your taxes to go to jail, so that, that may not be the best case. But, um, you know, manners, right? Uh, you might believe that you're obligated to be respectful of other people, um, but you don't really want to. He's like, that guy's a jerk. I really don't want to be respectful to him. But you are anyway, because you're supposed to be, uh, you're supposed to be polite to people. So the you know, acting out of obligation is another, uh, is another possibility for explaining an action for, for Rachel's. Another one uh, is uh, self-sacrifice, extreme cases of self-sacrifice. So uh, the soldier who throws himself on the grenade to save uh, his comrades. Um, Mother Teresa who gave up her life uh, to, uh, to help the sick and the poor. Um, uh, Cesar Chavez, who uh, suffered a lot of <laughs> suffered a lot of uh, uh, difficulties in his life because uh, of his fight for uh, for workers. Right? Uh, these are cases of extreme self-sacrifice. Now, Rachel's wants to say, look, you know, these are clearly cases where they're not acting in their self-interest. I mean, they're suffering. They're suffering a lot. Yes, they're working to benefit others. Okay, so Mother Teresa is working to benefit the poor. Cesar Chavez is working to benefit workers. Um, but it's not as if they ever think or can reasonably think that they're going to benefit from that work. Right? So Mother Teresa might start a movement to help the poor, but she's really aware of the fact that she's going to die before everybody is ever, you know, everybody is no longer poor. Uh, same thing with Cesar Chavez, you know, he's really sure that he was starting a movement, but, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe he didn't think he would ever see the end of it because he would, you know, die before the end. Um, you know, it looks, you know, cases where um, people sign up for the Secret Service to protect the President of the United States. You know, they might believe that everybody else would be better off if, you know, he takes the bullet, right, the assassins pointing the gun at the President and the Secret Service man or woman stands in the way and, and takes the bullet and, and dies a, as because of it. You know, they might think that they're helping everybody with, uh, by, by taking that bullet for the president, but it's not as if they expect that they're going to be able to see that benefit. Right? They're probably going to die in that situation. So with these cases of extreme self-sacrifice, uh, Rachel says, you know, look, this is, this is not a case where somebody is acting in their own self-interest. They're acting on behalf of others. So those are the two count examples, uh, acting out of obligation, acting uh, out of extreme self-sacrifice. Well, I'm sure what at least some of you are thinking right away, uh, and you know, a lot of people think this, I've heard it before, I'm sure you've heard of it, is uh, you know, talking about these cases of self-sacrifice, even cases of obligation. Um, you say, look, you, you know, these people that are acting out of obligation, they're acting out of extreme sacrifice, they're doing it because it feels good to do it. Right? It feels good to do it. So, you know, in the case of the parents, even though you don't really want to do what your parents tell you to do, uh, it makes you feel good to know that, uh, you know, you're making your parents happy or you're being a good child or, um, you know, you're, you know, whatever, you're, you're uh, taking it easy on your parents. Take your pick. In the cases of self-sacrifice, the idea is like, yeah, you know, that's extreme same self-sacrifice. It feels good to do that. It really does feel good. Uh, you feel very pleased with yourself for doing these 
really wonderful things. And you know, you might even take it further and say, well, the reason why people do this is so that they get praised by everybody else. Everybody praises this self-sacrificing behavior or this, you know, acting according to obligation. Uh, so you, you know, feel you feel like people are approving of you when you're performing these kinds of actions. And you know, I'm not denying that there's something to it. I'm sure there are people who act out of approval of others. But it's kind of hard to see that in some of these cases. Um, you, know, you listen to some of the autobiographies of these people who, who, who go through this extreme sacrifice, and they're they're going through a lot of hardship. <laughs> you know, if if we're talking about feeling good in, in the sense that that feeling of approval, I mean, I don't know about you, but there really hasn't been a time in my life where people have approved of what I've done, and that just skyrocketed me to the heights of wonder and joy. Uh, I mean, it feels nice to be approved of by others, but uh, it's never made me so elated that, for instance, you know, uh, I never, I never thought that uh, you know pe people's approval of me would feel better than, say, you know, living a life of hunger and with with hardly any, and, and hunger and and uh, illness and having hardly any uh, material need material needs satisfied. That that you know that would somehow be outweighed by public approval. I don't think that actually happens. Um, yeah, I'm not denying that it feels good to be approved of by others. I'm just, I don't think that it feels so good that it outweighs some of the things that these people went through. But yeah, let's suppose, let's suppose this even further, right? So, uh, you know, and just as a matter of fact, these people were not universally approved of in their time, right? Um, these heroes go through a lot of criticism. So it's not universal approval. But even just look at the idea and say, yeah, you know, the reason why you help like say you, you give five dollars to somebody on the street who's who's hungry the reason why you do this is because it feels good and that feeling good is in your best interest so uh, that's why you do it not because you care about the person who's hungry well why would you feel good about giving five dollars to somebody who's hungry if you didn't care about that person you know, I'm not denying that you feel good giving somebody who's hungry five dollars, but the reason why you feel good is because you're helping somebody. You care about their needs. Right? Um, kind of the same idea happens with the birthday gift, right? You feel good giving a birthday gift. Uh, hopefully you feel good giving a birthday gift, not because of approval by everybody else, but because uh, you want to bring a little joy and a uh, little excitement into somebody else's life celebrating on you know the day of their birth you care about that person if you give a birthday gift because you care about yourself there's something off there if you give a birthday gift and it's because you care about the person that's that's really good you know that that's perfectly normal right a, a good thing to experience so it, it, one reply to this whole idea behind uh, feeling good say well that you know that's the reason why you do it. it's in your self-interest but the reason why you feel good is because you care about somebody else so even if it is in your self-interest to feel good uh, the reason why you feel good is because of what you do for somebody else by the way don't ever feel guilty for feeling good about helping somebody else that's one of the worst lies we've perpetuated on ourselves if you feel good about giving to charity and helping others out, keep on feeling good. That's perfectly okay. Uh, psychological egoism also has another significant problem. Recall what was happening with psychological egoism. Uh, it started out pretty much presuming psych psychological egoism is true. It stated the only reason why people perform actions is to fulfill their own self-interest. That's not a proof. That's a presumption. Um, psychological egoism just interprets people's behavior. And you know, the, the, the guise of that is that you know, you can see people doing this. You see that they're acting and it, and it helps them, so it's their own self-interest. Like, yeah, here's, here's just something that's true. You never observe 
interpretate, I'm sorry, you never observe intentions. You can't. Intentions happen all in here, in the mind, in, you know, in the mind, in the brain, right? You never see what's going on there, right? And even if you, see, you know, wire up a person's brain and you um, are somehow able to figure out that they're thinking that this is in their intentions, which I'm not sure you can actually do, uh, you know, it's only those people, right? This isn't the universal hell claim. So when the psychological egoist offers this claim, there's no real evidence to back it up because you can't observe intentions. So you see Mother Teresa, yeah, you can interpret that to say that Mother Teresa thinks she's acting on her own best interests, but you can also interpret that to say that she uh, is acting in the interest of others. She believes she's acting in the interest of others. Uh, and it, you know, it's not hard to support the latter interpretation because Mother Teresa's life was hard. Cesar Chavez's life was hard. Um, George Washington, Ben Franklin, these guys, they, they went through significant difficulty for what they did. Right? Um, we could start uh, Martin Luther King, right? Wow, the guy suffered a lot for his cause. Um, so, you know, the fact that they suffered a lot for their cause and yet they keep pushing it is really strong evidence that they didn't think that this was merely going to help them out. So that, that's a kind of a huge problem with psychological egoism is that it's not, it's not, it's not, you know, the behavior is not evidence for its claim. They interpret the behavior, but that itself isn't evidence for the claim. Another real big problem with psychological egoism is what we just talked about in terms of uh, feeling good for, for the sake of others. It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty hard to refute, right? It, at the very least, you know, I mean, you have to do a couple of different things. One, you have you have to provide, you have to show that it's impossible for somebody to feel good about caring about somebody else's interests, right? You have to show that's impossible. And since most of you do it every day, I tend to think that that can't be done. Um, and that that in itself is kind of a nail in the coffin for psychological egoism. Psychological egoism is the claim that people, in fact, only uh, do what they, what's in their best interest or what they think is in their own best interest. Ethical egoism is different. Ethical egoism is the claim that you should do only what's in your own best interest. That you should do only what's in your own best interest. Now, uh, it, there's no, not necessarily a strict logical inconsistency between psychological egoism and ethical egoism. But if you're arguing that people should do something, you probably think that sometimes people don't. <laughs> so, in all likelihood, um, if you're an ethical egoist, you probably are not a psychological egoist. And on top of that, you know, if you are a psychological egoist, it kind of doesn't make any sense to argue for ethical egoism. It's, people, in fact, do this, and they should do this. It's like, why bother with the should? They already do. <laughs> so, um, there, there is a difference, and there's not necessarily a strict logical inconsistency, but e probably, e probably, you know, if you're an ethical egoist, you probably are not a psychological egoist. Now, um, psychological egoism, I'm sorry, ethical egoism is different. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, it says that you should only do what's in your own self-interest, what's in your own best interest. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't help anybody else, but helping somebody else uh, should benefit you, or at the very least, not interfere with anything else that you want, right? You know, it's convenient without any real cost. Okay, then it's okay to help somebody else. Uh, but psychological egoism says you should look out for number one. <laughs> you should look out only for your own interests. So, the first salvo <laughs> in the ethical egoist uh, arsenal is what they what's called the argument from self-defeat, and the idea is that altruism uh, defeats itself. So the argument starts off basically this way: so you ha you have a choice. You can either be uh, you can either act as an altruist, or you can act as an egoist, an ethical egoist. Well, uh, if you are acting 
for altruism, you are acting for other people's self-interest. Uh, sorry, for other people's interests. And there are at least three things that are in people's interests when you help them. The first is, you know, if you're trying to work for somebody else's benefit, you got to know what you're doing. You got to know uh, what they need, how to help them. Uh, you got to cover the bases and be sure that your help is actually going to help and not just cause further harm. The second thing is that you have to respect people's privacy. So, um, you know, invading people's privacy, I mean, I think you've all had occasions where somebody has invaded your privacy and that's just never a good thing, right? Um, we don't like it when somebody else uh, intrudes on our business, especially if they start messing around with our business. Uh, and third, uh, that you have to respect the dignity of the person, right? their dignity as an individual. Um, now, the ethical, the uh, ethical egoist is going to say altruism fails in all three regards. I mean, first of all, you can't know perfectly how to help somebody else, right? So even in the case where I, you know, I was giving uh, $5 to somebody who's hungry, the ethical egoist would say, look, you, you don't know what they're going to spend that $5 on. Uh, they could spend that $5 on uh, alcohol or drugs, right? Um, they might spend that $5... I don't know, paying somebody else to do something that's really wrong, right? Um, you don't know uh, that giving them $5 is going to help. Giving them food may not necessarily help. Maybe they take the food and sell it to somebody else, right? And then use that money for alcohol or, or drugs or what have you. Um, or maybe, uh, you know, there's a whole host of ways that you, that you can imagine how you trying to help could fail. So the ethical ego says, you don't know enough about what you're doing, since you don't know it perfectly, you don't know enough, know enough about what you're doing to help. So you shouldn't try. If you try to be altruistic, you're going to defeat the purpose of being altruistic. You shouldn't do it. The second, uh, the, the next one that they're dealing with is uh, this issue of privacy. And it's kind of related to the first one. So um, if you're really going to be altruistic and you're going to make sure that your help is going to help them, then you have to interfere in that person's business. So imagine that I'm giving the $5 to somebody on the street and I said, by the way, you have to tell me exactly how you're going to spend this and I have to approve of how you're going to spend this. Right. Um, so maybe I have to give some you know, embarrassing personal details. Maybe I watch them or I walk with them to go buy them these things or, or something like this. And you know, you'd be surprised how many people who actually do uh, go to charities uh, how much of their private life they actually have to reveal in order to uh, receive these benefits. Uh, and lastly, um, is, is the idea that you know if you if you you know is the idea that altruism doesn't actually respect a person's dignity. So here's how the argument goes: so like if you're giving charity to somebody, you know, I'm getting five dollars to somebody who's on the street. What I'm doing there is I'm telling that person that you don't know how to care for yourself. You're incompetent in running your own life. You're, um, you can't make the right decisions, so I have to make them for you. So the ethical ego says, you know, none of these things respect the dignity of a person. To respect the dignity of, of a person, you have to let them live their own life. Uh, you know, so in all three of these cases, the ethical egoist says, uh, altruism fails to achieve its purpose because you know, altruism is about looking out for the interests of others. Well, you're either not going to know about what you're doing, you're, or you're going to have to invade their privacy, or you're going to have to disrespect them. None of those looks out for the interests of another person. So uh, altruism inevitably defeats itself. Now, since the only choice is between altruism and ethical egoism, you should be an ethical egoist. That's the way that the argument from self-defeat runs. The next argument for ethical egoism is given by Ayn Rand, or at least it's a paraphrase of Ayn Rand's arguments. I'm not an Ayn Rand scholar, so I can't uh, tell you whether or not this is accurate, but we'll, we'll take a look at the argument and uh, take a look at, you know, see how, how it goes from there. So the first thing to look at is, is Rand's argument. Yeah, you know, we could call it, basically call this the uh, uh, argument for the respect of the person. And the first step is, is like the last argument. It's like you have a choice between altruism or uh, egoism. 
Now, with, uh, with any ethical theory, Rain says, you have to respect the dignity of the individual. You have to respect uh, the individual rights of a person. And this, you know, takes a lot of different forms. I mean, roughly what it means is, is like everybody has only this one life. Uh, you've got one shot at it, so you have to spend it on yourself. Right? Um, you have to pursue what you want to pursue. You have to uh, act as you want to act. It's very heavily influenced by the idea of personal choice right? and the importance of personal choice. And something about uh, the rights of an individual person, if you're going to respect the rights of an individual person, then you have to realize that they have goals. You know, pe people, an individual person has goals. Uh, so you have to let that person pursue their own goals. And the goals should be about themselves. Now, Rain says, if, if you're altruist, uh, what you're doing is you're requiring people to spend their lives on other people. Right? You're requiring that person to give up everything, give up all of their goals, what's in their own interest, and pursue the interests of others, pursue the benefit of the interests of others. Well, Rand thinks that this is not respecting the rights of the individual by demanding that the individual can pursue the individual's own goals. So, she concludes, altruism uh, you, know, you shouldn't choose altruism. Altruism is not a justified uh, moral theory. Um, so what you have left is ethical egoism. And that, in summation, is the argument for the respect of the individual. You notice it's not entirely too different from the argument that we just looked at. Another argument for ethical egoism is uh, that it, it that it coheres or best explains uh, common sense morality. Now the strategy here is a pretty general one. Most ethical theories try to do this at least at some point. They say uh, our theory best coheres with common sense morality. Uh, so it's 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 the theory that you already agree with. And the strategy here is, with, with the ethical egoist is pretty much not that different. So the egoist notes or observes that there's lots of rules and common sense morality. Rules like uh, honesty. Right? You should uh, strive to tell the truth. Rules like, um, you know, protecting life. Right? Um, you shouldn't <laughs> walk around uh, killing a random person. Uh, rules about justice and fairness. Right? You should give to people what's due to them. Now, the ethical egoist says these rules are in place, but the reason why they're in place is because they serve your best interest. If people disobeyed the rules all the time, everybody would suffer, including you. Okay? So, uh, and, you know, the reason why people want these rules in place is because they don't want, they want to avoid this kind of suffering. They're interested in themselves. So the idea is, uh, you know, with honesty, you know, so if everybody, if, matter of fact, if everybody lied in our society, uh, we'd all be in really bad shape. <laughs> imagine if the FDA lied about which drugs are safe. Right? Um, imagine uh, if, um, well, I was going to say, imagine if lawyers lied, but that may not be the best case. Uh, imagine, uh, I was going to say, imagine if advertisers lie, that may not be the best case either. But, you know, this kind of gets at what I'm saying. You know, they don't necessarily lie, but they certainly try to allow you to believe something. <laughs> which may or may not necessarily be the truth, uh, or even just necessarily what's good for you. you know, imagine if I lied to you all the time, you wouldn't know what to believe about philosophy. And yeah, I know enough about philosophy that I could cook up some doozies that could really cause some serious damage. Uh, your math teacher, your science teacher, your history teacher, they could all do the same thing. Right? Imagine if we lied all the time. Well, that'd be serious harm. The society would fall apart. You wouldn't know whether to believe anybody or not. And that the harm would harm you. So the ethical ego is to say the reason why these common sense morality, moral rules are in place is because they actually benefit you. Same thing with uh, killing. Right? If it was perfectly acceptable to kill a random person, you could be killed at any given moment. I'm out here in the park. Imagine it was okay to kill some random person if somebody came upon me. Right? That'd be a deadly situation. Um, 
same thing about justice. The reason why you care so much about everybody getting what's due is so that you get what's your due. Right? You care about this. So the argument is that uh, common sense morality already appeals to ethical egoism. And if it already appeals to ethical, ethical egoism, you already think that it's true. So this isn't like the other arguments where you have the choice between altruism and egoism, and altruism just fails. This is actually an argument in favor of uh, egoism. And the claim is, you already think it's right. Hmm. The next thing that Rachel does is he considers three objections to ethical egoism. Now, um, the first two, he doesn't... He doesn't really take them very seriously. <laughs> he just kind of mentions them and casts them aside and moves on to what he thinks is the main objection to ethical egoism. Since he doesn't spend a whole lot of time on them, I don't think I will either. The, the main objection that Rachel's brings against ethical, ethical egoism uh, is what ethical egoism considers to be the most important interest. So the idea behind ethical egoism is, is the interests that matter most are yours. Your interests are more important than anybody else's. The reason why you should look after number one is because number one's interests are more important. What has two thumbs and his most important interest? This guy. Right? <laughs> um, that's the idea behind ethical egoism. Now, what Rachel's pushes on here is that ethical egoism offers no proof that uh, your interests are are more important than anybody else's. And, you know, really when you kind of look at it, uh, you know, it's in fact impossible that everybody's interests are more important than everybody else's. Right? It just doesn't work out that way. Um, you, you, you know, that, that's, a, <laughs> that's a contradiction. You drive contradictions uh, simply from the use of the term more important than anybody else's. I suppose one person could try to argue that their interest is in fact more important than anybody else's, but they're not, uh, they're not arguing for ethical egoism. They're, off, they're arguing in favor of something like, you know, me-ism. <laughs> so if I were to say that my interests are more important than everybody else's, I'm offering ethical Hauganism. Right? <laughs> uh, but that's, that's not what's going on here. Uh, the other thing that Rachel points out is that in claiming that your interests are more important than anybody else's, you're violating that first condition that he talked about of what's required for a moral, not first condition, second condition, that he talked about what's required for a moral theory. Remember, there were two things. One, that your moral theory has to be supported by good moral reason. And two, that, you, uh, that all interests are equally important. That all interests are equally important. Yes, interests are going to conflict, but there's got to be a way to... Uh, um, you know, negotiate between them um, without just saying that somebody's interests are more important than somebody else's. So, um, that's Rachel's main argument there, his main objection is that ethical egoism violates the, the uh, condition of impartiality. 